I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor of AdvisorAnalyst.com. You're watching Episode 3 of Raise Your Average. My co-hosts are Rodrigo Gordillo and Mike Philbrick. Our very special guest today is Nancy Davis of Quadratic Capital Management, LLC. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Nancy, welcome to the show. It's really great to have you. We're very excited to talk to you today. Well, it's uh, great to be here with you this morning. I think it would be great if you would tell us your backstory. How did you start in the industry? Um, So I started in the industry at Goldman Sachs. I was really lucky to um, start learning about options in college. I took a couple, about five grad classes when I was an undergrad and I was always, it was an engineering fraternity. I was always really like that nerdy kid. And I found the world of derivatives and I was like, oh, it's math. I love math and you can make money with it. It's like, what's not to like? So I started trading options when I was an undergrad and I had never been, you know, I didn't know anybody at Goldman Sachs. I didn't know anybody who worked on Wall Street. I just had a professor in college who told me Goldman Sachs was the best firm. It had the best culture. And that's where you should try to work. So I applied to, you know, on the Internet, they said, like, pick one of like the six divisions. I applied to all of them. So I was a rule breaker from the beginning. (laughs) Was very fortunate to get um an interview and uh, came up to New York City. It was one of those like stress interviews with, you know, 20, 20 people you meet your first day. And I went through the whole process and I was I was lucky to get in the door. So I was not their typical hire. Um, you know, I did have a lot of options experience on my resume. And uh, I also wasn't, you know, wasn't from one of their, you know, feeder schools. Um, so I, I feel like I snuck in the back door, but it's a very entrepreneurial place. And really, I found a place where they, you know, reward success. And I think being a female trader, I was, you know, it's the ultimate meritocracy, right? Because it doesn't matter if you, you know, have, I've always had long blonde hair. I've always been a bubbly personality. And uh, if you make money, that's all that matters. So I, uh, I was very fortunate. Fantastic. What were the uh, what, any key learnings from those formative years coming out of college, trading options? I, I think uh, I, I heard a story that you 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 paid for your first apartment or doing something uh, trading options, which is very unusual. Yeah. No. I um. I did. Uh, I I was a scholarship kid, so I had a academic presidential academic scholarship for to um, pay for you know, school, um, but not, you know, I still wanted to hang out with my friends and go and eat, you know, go out to dinner and go out with people and nobody was sending me checks. So I had a full-time job all through college and that's where I got disposable income uh, to A, buy options and B, I did a lot of traveling as well. It was like kind of crazy. I did, you know, I went to the Peruvian Amazon. I went to Morocco. I was traveling all over the world when I was a college student. So I was always kind of, I guess, an adventurous person and wanted to learn more about, you know, lots of things. And um, when I got to Goldman, uh, long-term capital was kind of just starting. And I think that was pretty, pretty formative um, for me in setting my investment style because, you know, tied up with a bow, they were very, very short volatility in Asia. And that's what blew up that firm. And I think seeing that right at the beginning of my career really helped me, um, especially when I moved to the prop desk. I spoke, spent the bulk of my 10 years at Goldman in the proprietary trading groups. So it was no, no clients. It was just investing Goldman's capital. And I felt like it was a really great way to invest because you always had that, that defined downside and the asymmetric payoff. So if you were wrong, you knew how much you could lose and size it appropriately. And if you were right, you had the asymmetry. So I think it was just a, a great learning environment. But I do think um, long-term capital blowing up was sort of the wake-up call for me. And I feel like everybody so did has you stop? Did place. you stop shorting volatility uh, after you saw that? Were, like, were you playing both sides and then decided to do long ball? 
Yeah, I never was a um, a short vol person ever. Um, even when I was trading for my own account, I always bought options. Um, I used, I'm sure you guys have heard this, but I joked, you know, I remember being uh, as a college student, some of my friends like to shop and they like to buy like shoes and clothes and purses. I have like zero interest in that today. I, I'm wearing no shoes right now. You know, I, I wear flip flops all the time. I'm just not like not into clothes, not into shoes, not into any, I don't even shop. Um, but I love to buy options. And so for me, it was, I, and I'm not a big like Delta one derivatives person. I don't really like linear derivatives. You know what I mean by Delta one is futures, forwards, swaps, things that go up and down a dollar. To me, that's kind of like a credit card, you know, exposure where you don't really pay for something, but you get exposure to it. I like using fully funded long options. That's what I did in my own account when, um, before I got to Goldman, that's what I did at Goldman um, on the prop side. So it's probably a little bit different, but I guess that also builds, you know, a long career when you're doing something that not everybody else is. And how, so how you, did you I, make I interrupted. The, the jump then from Goldman Sachs to, to, um, to uh, building your own firm at Quadra Quadratic and, and uh, making this, uh, what's well, been a, a massive success story, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us how that leap happened. To start Quadratic? Yeah. Or, or moving from where you were in the prop side to actually starting a Quadratic and, and, and the pretty significant success you've had. It's been, it's been quite a lovely run. Oh, thank you. No, it's been um, an amazing experience. I started my own firm in 2013, and I, uh, I'll show you a picture of my phone this is my iPhone and most like normal people will have pictures of their dog or their kids or, you know, their spouse or something, some vacation trip. I have a picture of my first office <laughs> on my phone <laughs> and, you know, it was literally like, I don't know if you can see in the picture, but it's literally like a, a brick building. I got a bronze sign. I stuck it on the building. I bought office furniture. I bought a phone system. You know, like, I just, I built it, you know, it felt like field of dreams, you know, build it, they will come. Um, but my approach was always, if I don't believe in myself and I'm not investing my own money into what I'm doing, why would, why would any investor give me their money if I don't believe in me? So I, uh, I did, I do think it was a pretty risky thing to do to, you know, start your own firm, but I've never looked back and I've loved every moment of it. And I think I've also, tried to inspire other people to really, you know, I feel like it's taking the reins for yourself, right? You're, it's the ultimate call option on your, whether on your own business, right? So I, uh, I believed in what I was doing and put my money behind it and took the chance. And I think like all entrepreneurs, when you, when you start a business, um, you know, it, you, you have to really change mentalities because you go from being, paid to work, right? That's like when you have a job and you have a W-2, you get paid to work. And you, when you start a business, you're paying to work. You know, you're Absolutely. paying other people to work for you. <laughs> and so it's a complete, you know, you got to be, I think, a little bit just like a true believer in what you're doing because it's, it's completely backward cash flows from having a job. Welcome well, to Matthew, you were, Yeah, look at this. Since 2015 when we launched, that's my... Uh, that that's, is, okay, we're, exactly. we're all in the same boat we can i have two beautiful <laughs> kids and wife had yeah. many adventures haven't changed that since we launched so i'm with you i'm yeah. with you for sure so yeah. you've been you, you've yeah. been long ball your whole career and uh yeah, I, mean, I, I did have a period when i started at goldman when i was on the um derivatives desk so i did a lot of um at that point a lot of dispersion and things like that and i traded the scandinavia book for a while um, more like structured products, but generally, you know, in my investing career, uh, it's always been um, having, you know, we we occasionally will sell spreads, like, so I'll use put spreads, call spreads, but if we ever sell options, I always do it with defined downside. Um, so, so. so one of the things I wanted to, because I want to talk about the, the how you structure your trades, but first I want to... <laughs> Can I discuss a little bit about how you think about constructing your macro ideas that you then use options instruments in order to manifest? So 
you, you, from my understanding, you're a global macro thinker. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. And then, and so just why don't you tell us a little bit about how you think about uh, your ideas and your, your trading ideas and then how you put them together in this unique long volatility or long options type trading. I mean, I don't think of myself personally as like a great macro thinker. I think there are lots of people who are, you know, exceptional at doing that. I'm not an economist. I'm not, you know, I don't I really enjoy pontificating about what I think is going to happen in the future because I'm kind of one of those people that nobody, I don't believe anybody knows. Um, I think a lot of people are great at telling stories and have great narratives. But I think the reality is, is like nobody knows what's going to happen. So I think of myself as a um, professional convexity sniffer. Like, I think that's where I'm super skilled. It's not predicting what's going to happen in the future, but it is looking at markets and saying, you know, when there's complacency, when everybody, you know, all these, you know, pontificators think, you know, 99% chance of this happening, it's usually the opposite in my experience that happens. So yeah. I guess I've always been a little bit of a, a contrarian, like we were, we were short turkey when everybody was like super into carry strategies. And, you know, I was like, this doesn't make any sense. This is, you know, so I think I've always been a little bit contrarian, but what we did with our ETF, I think was more, more problem solving because I just felt like there was, there was an issue that many fixed income investors had been pushed out the credit spectrum to get monthly income they had been pushed out in duration uh, to get returns and yield. They were massively selling volatility all over these fixed income portfolios, whether it was mortgages or structured credit or you know these private credit strategies where you give up liquidity. And I just saw, you know, that was a problem. And so for me, I've always been kind of trying to solve problems with option strategies. And so I think that's it wasn't like I, you know, thought or I had no clairvoyance about, oh, there's going to be a global pandemic and, you know, the world is going to be focused on reflation. Like, no, I didn't know that was nobody knew that. If anybody claimed they knew that, I call bullshit because <laughs> nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. And so for us, it's more about giving investors better choices, problem solving for their portfolio and creating products that that you can own long term. Um, I think that's one problem with equity volatility is it's it's really hard to own, right? It's more of a timing thing or you have to sell it one place to buy it someplace else. And I, I don't like RV personally because I feel like you can lose money on both sides. You know what? You, that's relative value it, for those listener, uh, yeah. for those advisors. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, just to even like let's dumb it down, forget options and volatility. If you have a equity long short fund just to take that's the ultimate rv strategy you are buying one you know say a stock that you think is cheap and going to go up and you're selling another one that you think it's going to go down you can actually lose money on both of those positions at the same time so i don't like doing that i don't think uh that kind of extracting that edge whether it's implied vol or one stock versus another stock within a sector you know, leave that to somebody else. That's not what gets me excited. What gets me excited is giving people a product that they can own ball for the long term, um, have an asset allocation to something that's diversifying, and then also solve all these other problems that people have on the fixed income side. Nancy, can we can we just go back to convexity? And can you can you, for the benefit of those who don't know what convexity is, can you explain it or provide you know? maybe use an yeah. analogy that 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 does it appropriately so convexity and gamma are kind of used interchangeably um gamma convexity those things are what actually matter inside of a person's portfolio and very simply said when you're when you're long convexity or long gamma what you do is you buy low and sell high um and that is super important for investors because you want to be I think Warren Buffett nicely said it, that when you make your money is actually when you buy a security, not when you sell it. Um, and so having, you know, bonds are long convexity. Um, having, you know, eyeball is long government bonds. 85% of the fund is treasuries with inflation protection. And then we add 
long options. And whenever you're long an option, it doesn't matter what type of option it is. If you buy an option, you're long gamma and you're long vol. And I think having that long gamma is the most important thing for investors' portfolios um, because you want to own convexity. So, so when everything else, you know, when stocks are selling off, credit spreads tend to be widening, right? So if you have a portfolio that looks like a 60-40 and you're like, well, I have stocks and I have my bonds and that's going to diversify it. Well, if it's credit, you know, let's just take a simple example. If you own Apple stock and you own Apple bonds, it's like same thing, right? It's not any different. It's still corporate uh, spread risk. You still have management team risk. You still have product risk. You still have sector risk. And so I think many investors have been pushed out the credit spectrum to get returns in this really, really low, if not negative, yielding world of government bonds, which is, you know, whack. So they've been pushed out into all these kind of crazy credit like private credit is considered this like unicorn strategy. Like it's still, you know, it's still a company. It still has expenses. It still has revenue. It still has profits. It's not really any different other than it's not marked as often as public credit. But I think giving people a fixed income solution is incredibly important because people don't know what to do on the fixed income side. And and the fifteen percent that you use long volatility options on what what type of positions are those? Are they all purely fixed income based? Yeah, the, everything within the iVol ETF is fixed income, so we have nothing to do with the equity market at all. It tends to have um, potentially a negative correlation to equities because it is long vol. It's also long government bonds. Um, so like in March, we had positive performance in March 2020, even though the treasuries inside the fund were down about one and a half percent, eyeball was up 80 basis points uh, that month. So, um, but and it's not equity. the interest rate volatility well. spiked. Well, I think that was a good period for people who have credit, you know, credit like Barclays Ag, high yield bonds, anything with credit spread. When equities sell off, credit spreads widen. Right. So you can't, you know, not all bonds are created the same. And so when people say, oh, I'm long equities and I'm long bonds, it's always like, well, what kind of bonds are you using? Is it, if it's government bonds, it may or may not work. But if it's credit, you definitely are going to lose money at the same time as equities because it is the same company. Right. It's just a different part of the cap structure. You know, what you've done is something very unique for investors that gives them. A, a true diversifier, a true alternative to a lot of the alternatives that are out there. It is something pretty different. And uh, it's, uh, I think a lot of investors have been pushed out the credit spectrum uh, in the search for yield over the last uh, many years in this low interest rate environment globally. And many investors are taking, you know, either a lot of duration risk in their portfolio or a lot of credit risk. And so we're excited about giving a different fixed income alternative to investors. It has nothing, the the fund um, eyeball that I manage has nothing to do with the equities, but because it's long fixed income volatility, generally in periods of market stress, you know, correlations go up across the board. Everything gets really crazy, all markets. And so this is not equity vol, it's um, fixed income vol. But I think most uh, most regular investors just need to remember that Anywhere they own U.S. mortgages, those those fixed income positions are short volatility. And so I know volatility sounds really like a scary word to a lot of uh, a lot of investors. But it's not if you, uh, you know, in the fixed income side of the portfolio, they already have short vol from mortgages and mortgages make up such a huge percent of many of these indices like the Barclays Bloomberg Ag Index, which is a lot of what passive and active managers benchmark 28% of that index is mortgages and therefore short ball. We provide access to the rates market. So um, the rates market includes um, all of the sovereign bond, specifically our fund is U.S. So it's the U.S. Treasury market plus the rates market, meaning interest rates. And to me, um, that's the biggest uh, asset class in the world. It's what most people have exposure to, whether you're 
an institutional investor, individual investor, like let's just take, you know, a common, uh, most people, you know, in the world, 80% of their net worth is tied up in real estate. And if you're a real estate investor on the professional side, they all hedge rates, right? That's just the cost of doing business, but most regular people don't. So we thought it was a really good solution to give people access to the rates market that they previously, you know, they're, most people within their their portfolios are slicing and dicing uh, equities and bonds, right? Whether it's credit bonds or government bonds, but it's all, you know, it's all cut up the same. It's all, I call it ham, right? It's all ham. Um, it might be some is viral, some is smoke, some is factor, some is sector, some is thematic, but it's still, you know, it's still corporate America, it's still stocks and bonds, like nothing that different. Whereas what we do with our product is really something different. And I guess over the course of my life, I've always been kind of a, a different thinker. Um, and I think, you know, today's environment in particular, when you have everything is so expensive in financial markets, right? You have equities and credit spread near their all time highs and prices. And people really need to be thinking what's what's different, what's good value. And I think that's where really where um, where our strategy comes in. I, I think it's important. I think I think it's important just just for a moment to contextualize the size of the various markets, um, because I, I'm not sure that most um Advisors would understand that, you know, the equity market in the U.S. is about $34 trillion, the credit market's $28 trillion, treasuries are $16 trillion, and over-the-counter over the counter rates are $200 trillion. Can I share my screen? Would that be okay? Because I have a good picture. Um, can you see this, this page? Yes. Okay, cool. So this is, um, this is just our fund website. Uh, it's eyeballetf.com. And the picture I wanted to show is on our fact sheet, which is right here. Um, and if you scroll down to the second page, this is, I think, just a great picture to just just articulate what you just said is that the rates market is so big. This is most people are slicing and dicing equities or credit or treasuries. Um, our ETF is 85 percent of it is treasuries. And then we access this market, which is huge. It's a it's a really big market. And that's what gives this fund. Um, we have this very low correlation to other common asset classes. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yep. And that's because for, for those for those listening, you might want to just sort of share the general insights from the, the data that's on there. Right, right. So basically, um, our eyeball ETF has not had really any correlation to some of the most common indices, like we can run the numbers against anything I just picked like a hodgepodge of stuff. This is the um, US equity markets 0.03. We're not correlated to the VIX at all. We actually have a negative 0.3 correlation. It's not correlated to the ag because it's not, you know, the Barclays ag is one of the biggest benchmarks out there for diversified fixed income. But my big problem with the Barclays ag is that it's mostly um, a third of it is short volatility from their mortgage risk. And then there's no inflation protection in the ag. So if you have this is a good slide to show um, for those of you who can see the video, but the Barclays Ag is um, approximately a third credit, uh, approximately a third mortgages, and then it has all this treasury exposure, but the treasuries are all what we call nominal treasuries, which is treasuries without inflation protection. So if you own, you know, if you own a manager that's benchmarked to the Ag, who's active, or if you own a passive index that's benchmarked to the ag, you don't have any inflation protection and your short volatility. So we see many people using eyeball as a as a complement to their existing fixed income managers to gain exposure to inflation plus inflation expectations and try to reduce uh, the volatility that's in fixed income portfolios. Expand on that idea of short vol in the context of the bond portfolio regime, if you could. I think um, the listeners would and viewers would, would uh, get, get garner some value from that. Yeah, so, so mortgages, U.S. mortgages are short volatility. If you just Google it, like, are U.S. mortgages short volatility? Yes, they are. And that's because the U.S. homeowner is long the option to prepay that loan 
whenever they want. So because the U.S. homeowner can prepay, the owner of the mortgage is short an option to the homeowner. And they have fancy terms for it in the, in the, uh, in the investing world. They call it convexity correction or you know, all sorts of terminology that's jargon. But at the end of the day, if you own mortgages in your fixed income portfolio, you are short options to U.S. homeowners, therefore short volatility. And just like when yields go higher, bond prices go down, when volatility picks up in the market, you know, implied volatility, mortgages will lose money in price terms because of that ball is an input that goes into the price, just like interest rates. And so I think a lot of people, you know, remember that from the financial crisis, but um, many people, and volatility is so incredibly cheap too in interest rates. There's no, um, there's no index for eyeball um, because the index guys really um, are more from uh, the equity market, but you can pull up things like, you know, the move index is trying to replicate the rates market. It's not really the OTC rates market. It uses treasury vol, which is not, you know, it's not the OTC rates market, but it's the best we have to look at a historical chart. Um, and you can see this index started in the late 80s and interest rate volatility as measured by the move is near all time, like straight it's up financial markets. It's longer than it was before the crisis. Yeah. I, I saw it, it, I saw it, it the other day. Year. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. You must be you must be backing up the truck right now. Yeah, yeah I, that's something to discuss as well. Is when when is a good time to start buying these options and, and sniffing out that cheap convexity? Absolutely, no. I do. Um, I think of myself as a. Um, you know, some people say I look like Lady Gaga, and so I took this from that theme. But uh, I I think I I am the Vega monster. She's Mother Monster. I am Vega Monster. So I can't buy enough all. I think it's so cheap. I just want to back up the truck. And we've really been terming out the tenor of the options inside of the eyeball ETF. Uh, you guys are cracking up, right? I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> You have to be a little self-deprecating in this industry and like take it light. But um, the average tenor of options in our portfolio is 20 months. And that's because when you own longer dated options, they have more Vega, Vega sensitivity, which is the sensitivity to a change in vol. And so historically, our portfolio, when we first listed the fund, didn't have such long dated options. But now with vol, the way I think about it is a... Uh, sh a short dated option, if you're long a short dated option, you have less of a window to be right. So it's more risky because it's either a zero or one. A longer dated option, you have more time for that theme to play out and you also have less time decay. So the reason short dated options are very popular because a lot of people like to sell options as a carry or a premium gathering trade and they decay faster the shorter they are. So the reason a lot of people use like weekly options or one month options is because they like to sell it all. And, you know, if you sell an option, the most you can ever make is that premium that you receive. That that is that is the most. So all you want, you just you're just like, go away. You want it to die and expire worthless. And so I think that's why a lot of these indices like the VIX or the move, a lot of them are focusing on that 30 day window. Not all vol is equal. <laughs> um, so equity volatility, there's nothing that you can do. If you buy an option, it doesn't matter if it's a call or put, but you bleed time decay. So you lose money. What that means like in, in you know, you can lose money, you know, say 90% of the time. And then you have these short periods where vol will spike and you can make a lot if you're long or if you're short, you can lose, you know, you could lose five years of returns in a day, you know, being short equity vol. But with equity vol, there's nothing you can do. There's no offset to the time decay. Um, that's why I think fixed income is a better place to own volatility because there are things, there is um, the, the concept of role that exists, whether you're in FX options or, um, fix other types of fixed income options. So you can have positive roll. You still pay theta, which is the, the terminology for the time decay. So you still have theta on one side, but you can actually get positive roll on the other. And so the options that we use inside of Ival are interest rate options. And not always, but most of the time, 
there's very benign, if not positive role that we receive. And so it allows you to not have to time it. Again, I'm not a market timer. I think of, you know, inflation protection in my mind is just something people should own. Like it doesn't matter whether you think there's going to be deflation or inflation or what you think is going to happen in the world. I think it's completely irrelevant. It's like, um, I think of it as almost if you own a home or an apartment or you rent, everybody has homeowners insurance, right? Do, do you, you know, at the end of the year, if your house doesn't burn down, are you, are you mad about that? Are you like, Oh, that was a stupid waste of money. <laughs> you know, like I feel like I think of inflation protection as that because the one thing everybody doesn't want to out, you know, you don't want to outlive your wealth. Right. And the way that you outlive your wealth is you either have all your assets sell off together all at the same time. So you lose um, the market value of the portfolio or you have inflation. And so I think it's something that just everybody should own, regardless of what they think is going to happen in the future. It doesn't matter. I, I feel like we actually have some, you know, uber deflationists who own the eyeball ETF. And the reason that they do is that, you know, 99% of their portfolio is set up for deflation. <laughs> so it's a good, you know, even if you think it's to be deflation yeah. forever, we, we can have a negative carry with the options in certain periods, but most of the time the options have really attractive role. And you can see that with, here, I'm going to do the share screen again for those. Does, does anyone feel up to explaining role yield for those on the call who might not understand that? Can I first say, I, I just wanted to go back to your comment, uh, Nancy, about insurance, because most, a regular insurance policy, you pay and you pay and you pay. And mm -hmm. if nothing ever happens, you've just, you've just paid a lot of premium for protection that you never collected on in a way because in order to collect on that on that premium that you've paid towards the insurance you have to lose money you have to lose an asset or something has to go wrong and then you get made whole by the insurance i think of it as a little differently because um in the when investing in the inflation market inflation has no zero bound right it can go massively negative there there's no cap and so i i view our strategy as a you know, more conservative way, you know, if you, again, going back to my Goldman roots, you know, having that asymmetric payoff when you're right, having that defined downside if you're wrong, because nobody knows which regime we're going to be in, right? Are we going to be in a deflationary spiral? Like, you know, are we turning into Japan or are we going to, you know, have a stagflationary environment, which is when stocks and bonds sell off together and, you know, close your eyes, like what's stagflation? It's low growth, high unemployment, higher prices in the form of like non-growthy supply shocks, like that could happen too. That's not a non-zero probability. Or we could be in more of a risk on environment like equities and credit markets are already pricing in and the vaccine's gonna be out, we're gonna get back to work, life's gonna be good and we're gonna have good inflation. But either, you know, stagflation, deflation, inflation, I don't think it really matters which environment we're going to be in. The reality is, is that most people do not think the Fed is going to be successful in achieving their inflation mandate. Like, you know, if you pick 10 people, you know, from your from this audience and you say, you know, what do you think is going to happen? Probably nine of them are going to say it's going to be deflation and they're going to cite technology and they're going to cite you know, demographics and all the all the reasons people do that. But it's priced in. That's why the markets are efficient. Like that's why interest rate ball is so freaking cheap. Yeah. So to me, it's just the the cost of owning that, even if it doesn't happen, is worth it because it's priced very low, in my opinion. Yeah. So I mean, the point I guess the point I was going to make was that what was interesting about looking at the behavior of Ival was that the kind of insurance uh, through diversification that you're that your ETF is actually providing earns a return while you're while you're in that hedging position, as opposed to just being a dormant policy that pays only when something goes wrong. Um, yours, your ETF is actually providing an element of diversity that that provides a return in the waiting period. So now, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
it, it we do pay out a um a 30 basis point monthly distribution and um we think that's really important because many investors are going down the spectrum in credit because they need that monthly that monthly distribution and so we feel like i've all you know, kind of potentially check that box of saying, look, we get the monthly monthly distribution. Of, we say a minimum of 30 basis points because in December 2019, we actually paid out 50. Um, but since we started paying distributions in the summer of 2019, it's always been at least 30 basis points. And, um, and the strategy is not, even though it's long volatility, the options have a really unique role feature, which is why um, it's not most people in whether it's ETFs or mutual funds or vol funds, most people trade equity vol um, or they trade, you know, cross asset cost vol or cross, you know, maybe they might buy uh, buy vol in one market and sell vol in another market. This is just pure long volatility, but it's a much easier to own, in my opinion, vol than trying to do equities, which is more of a timing thing. Can, can we dig in a little bit to the 85% of the portfolio that's in tips, which actually in and of itself is quite a nice complement to a bond portfolio just in and of itself and generally a very under-owned asset class, probably you know largely understood. And so you, you've got a, a beautiful cloaking going on. So risks to bond portfolios are the vol that you, you, you mentioned, the, the mortgage sort of short vol. Uh, and then, of course, we have inflation expectations and then shocks to those expectations that create difficulties for nominal bonds. And you've taken the approach of saying, well, let's have 85% of the portfolio in tips. Maybe talk about that. Talk about the vulnerabilities that that tips have. So they, they certainly hedge a certain type of inflation, but there is maybe some basis risk there due to some government finagling, maybe. Uh, maybe uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll let you expand on that. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. It's a good point. You know, most most investors that they have um, treasuries inside their portfolio, they're not inflation protected treasuries. I think a lot of that is just like old legacy indices, like the the AG, the Bloomberg Barclays AG index used to be the Lehman AG index, and it was created. Um, you know, think about how how young the tips market is. The tips market was invented around the same time that I started my career at Goldman in the late 90s is when the U.S. Treasury invented the tips market. Um, we have not had, you know, runaway inflation since the tips market was created. And I personally see, you know, two flaws with owning tips by themselves. Number one is tips are long duration, right? That means they lose money mathematically when yields go higher which you know likely will happen if people price in more inflation. Um, so you want to have a hedge to that duration. You know, if you look at huge risk on days, like for instance, uh, November 9th, right? If you recall, that was the day the you, the vaccine was announced in the U.S. and the markets just ripped, right? Like equities ripped, credit spreads tightened. Anything that had duration in that environment tended to lose money. I've, I've been yet to find a fixed income fund that was up that day, um, except Eyeball. Eyeball was up 66 basis points on November 9th, even though 85% of it is tips and tips were down 30 basis points. So think about just that one day, we had almost 100 basis points of outperformance. And that's because it's not, you know, we are long government bond duration. Right. But that option has the asymmetric payoff to potentially do well if yields go higher, which I think will happen if we actually have inflation. Now, on the other side, going back to, to your point, Mike, about the measure of inflation, you know, again, I'm not a big index lover, but the CPI index, it is a index. It is the index that is created by one U.S. government entity which is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they create this basket, this index, to represent inflation, but it's not the only way to measure inflation, right? It may not be, you know, it's what a lot of people use, but even the Fed doesn't use CPI inflation. They have their all, you know, whether they use PCE or other measurements. And the big problem that I see with CPI is it's mostly um, energy and food 
and shelter, and I use air quotes for shelter, because shelter, if you just dig into it a little bit, like one level below, it's mostly urban rent. And I don't know what's got happening in your city with the pandemic, but at least around here, I'm outside of New York City. Rents are down. Rents are below like 10 year ago levels because of everybody de-urbanizing and trying to get more space. So I don't think shelter is necessarily the right measure of inflation, especially for bond investors. It's like, who cares about rent? And so I think it's super important to add other measures of inflation expectations that are not linked to CPI, just because like, think about how crazy that is. Like, why would anybody want to put all their chips on one index as a measure of inflation? Agreed. So when you, are you thinking about that as you construct the 15% of the portfolio vis-a-vis via, via your 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 options book, you're, you're thinking, okay, I've got tips covered, and and that might be a little inaccurate, but it, it's 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 a CPI accurate ish, and and then what do you do? Do you look at sort of twos tens and inflation expectations? Do you build your book of options off of that and look for uh, cheap convexity? How, how do you go through? How do you complement the tips in the in the fifteen percent? Yes, that's where we access the rates market. Um, the rates market is the biggest market, and we look at inflation expectations as measured by the swaps curve. We like using the swaps curve because it's not it's taking it away from just the treasury market. Most of the time, treasuries and swaps trade close to each other. But with the swaps curve, you have you know all global investors. Think about every single corporate issuer around the world hedges their rate exposure in the swaps market. So if it's like a Taiwanese company or a European company or a South African, like the whole world trades in the swaps market. And we think that is a more market-based measure of inflation expectations. You know, currently, uh, the best way to think about it, in my opinion, is like a CD. You know, if you open, if you go to a bank and you open a CD today, policy rates are near the zero bound. Maybe you get five basis points of your own, maybe 10 basis points. Let's assume you get 10 basis points for, you know, a, a three month CD, which is probably too high, but assume 10. And then you say, okay, what if I go out two years? Because the rates market is pricing and the Fed is going to be on hold, you know, for the next two years, you get the same. So a two year CD, also 10 basis points. So then if you say, okay, hi, I can't live off 10 basis points. That's ridiculous. What if I, I don't need this money for 10 years. Let's go lock it up for 10 years. How much more would you get paid? It's less than 90 basis points, like less than 1% to lock up your money for a decade, even though the last CPI print was well above that. So we see that as a more market-based measure of inflation expectations because it's where lenders will lend money. And I think that is crazy. It doesn't make any sense to me why it's so incredibly flat. If you look back to 2013, just to pick a point where there was no inflation, if you recall, that was coming out of um, Greece started to kind of implode at the end of 2011 into 2012. We were having the full blown European uh, debt crisis. People were not worried about inflation. Like people were thinking, is this going to be a wait again? But it was just normal at that period. If you go back to that time, if you went to a bank, policy rates were still near the zero bound. That was before the Fed started hiking rates. So we were at kind of, you know, under 50 basis points out the, to the two year point. But it was just normal. If you locked up your capital for 10 years, you would get paid two and a half you know, two and a half percent was just like normal. There was there was no inflation. There was nothing going on. There was no like there's no blue wave. There was no average inflation targeting. There was no fiscal spending. There was no people talking about inflation. Nothing was happening. And that's why to me, I like slam the table like this is the time to be buying it because nobody believes that inflation is going to happen. Everybody has been lulled into being a deflation forever. Bonds bid forever. Bonds are going to diversify my 60-40 equity portfolio like they have the last 30 years. And so it's a good time to be a contrarian because there's not a lot of stuff you can buy in financial markets today that are trading near 
you know, below like three year, five year, 10 year levels, there's it's interest rate vol and inflation expectations as measured by the rates market. I don't know of anything else that's trading in a value point of view today in financial markets. Do you guys, maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> no, no, I think I think that's, I mean, look, what I love about this discussion is that, you know, earlier in the call, in the, in the podcast, we talked about how everything's priced into the markets, right? But mm -hmm. hey, you're, we're, we're all trying to make alpha here. You have to take yep. a position. And so you've laid out a bunch of reasons as to why the markets are wrong in this particular scenario. But you're not a linear trader, right? You're an, you're an asymmetric trader with at a, at a t point in time where the cost of putting in a position for a leap or for a long-term dated uh, option is very, very low. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the advantages of putting, putting together a thesis like you did and then the, the way you got you uh, as a long volatility manager can, can r play that out better than, than a linear manager may. A lot of people hear the word volatility and they think negative, you know, it has a lot of negative connotations. But I like to remind, especially fixed income investors, any place you have the ag, any place you have mortgages, you're already short volatility in those holdings. And I think that is more of an education. And we want to be really transparent about what IVOL is, right? The, the fund name, the official name for IVOL is the quadratic interest rate volatility and inflation had GTF. Like it's a bit of a mouthful, but I want people to know what they own. And I'm proud of it. Like I want people to understand what the fund does. I want I want to be in your face that we use options. You know, it, it is an in your face product. There are a lot of fixed income ETFs that use linear derivatives. So, you know, whether it's features or forwards or swaps and linear derivatives to me um, are just just leverage, right? It's getting exposure to something but not really paying for it. I want people to understand that this fund is long volatility. I want people to understand that we're accessing the interest rate markets. And so we try to be really transparent about it. But a lot of it is education to say, you know, it's kind of like, imagine if you've, uh, if you've never, you know, say there was no television or internet, and you, you've never been to Africa, and you don't know you don't know what a giraffe looks like, right? You've never seen one. And I feel like describing eyeball is kind of like describing a giraffe to somebody who's never seen one because you have to compare it to other stuff and, you know, to say, all right, this is, you know, what you do with it, right? Like most, most bond investors, the reason that they have fixed income is for two point, two reasons. Like you're just making it very simple. They own it for a monthly distribution for income. And they own it because they want it to diversify their equity risks. And so I think Ival can accomplish those two goals in a different way. And it's not correlated to things that they already own because we are we are the giraffe, right? To use that analogy, like people don't have this in their portfolio already. And that's why it tends to have low correlation. And I think that's why that's why it's good because it is it is something different. But it is it is a hard conversation with people because they hear, you know, quadratic interest rate volatility and inflation hedge. They're like, whoa, what is that? <laughs> you know, it sounds scary. <laughs> you know, it sounds really confusing. Um, but I don't really see it as any, you know, if you think about what a mortgage is, like you just close your eyes and you're like, all right, what is, what is a mortgage? It's a agency obligation. And then it's coupled with a short option. If you own the mortgage, you have the agency obligation and that short option to the homeowner. I see eyeball treasury obligation, it's tips, and then it has that long option. So I see it's almost like a mirror image, but at least we know with the options what our downside is because they're long only. I, I think and people just, forget that in the 70s, you had equities and bonds lose money at the same time. Yeah. Right. So that diversifying factor may not be there. So having a third leg to your portfolio that would go possibly up when bonds are going down, when traditional you know, treasuries go down through, because of an inflationary shock is, is key. Sorry, Mike, you were saying. Yeah, I, I just thought that this is where the, the home sort of the opportunity, the opportunity at the moment when we think about the home insurance analogy is one of um, Right now, you can buy home insurance at the cheapest price possible, and you can lock it in for a very long time. 
And this is a little bit different. So people think about, oh, I have my car insurance or home insurance and I pay for that every year. And, you know, claims will come in and maybe it goes up and down a little bit. But as you've outlined the situation today, Nancy, it seems to me like vols low, expectations of inflation are low. The price for the insurance at the moment is exceptionally cheap. And so for one to think about in, uh, hedging inflation risk in their portfolio, in their bond portfolio, it doesn't get much cheaper than this, it would seem, in a, in a, in a long-term context. Well, like you, you said, on the five and ten year. You stick year. to it much longer than you ever have. Yeah. Now, I wonder, so um, now, yeah, I that, agreed. That, that, that just to recap, that, that's largely due to the fact that, that the market is still continuing to have a, a deflationary uh, outlook on, on, as opposed to inflationary, right? I mean, well, so if I'm a, yeah. Just to g decompose that a little, because a lot of people, when they talk about inflation expectations, they're talking about break even. So they're talking about the difference between inflation protected treasuries and nominal treasuries. And that all goes back to that, that one index, CPI. So I don't believe CPI is the only way to measure inflation expectations. CPI inflation has already risen. I don't know if you can still see my screen, but 10-year um, break-even is... We, we can't, but, but, but hit, the, hit, this, hit, the, hit the share hit screen button. 217 right now. The 10-year break-even is 207. A lot of investors access inflation swaps, which is a, you know, a linear product. So it goes up and down a dollar. It can go, you know, inflation can go negative, right? There's no cap on it. And inflation swaps are always trading at a premium to where break-evens are. And that's because the sell side loves to sell it. They're sold inside of retail structured products. And inflation swaps, I think, are yuck because it's still CPI inflation. And then you always pay a premium above break-even. So like right now, five-year break-even um, is 217. 10-year break-even is 207. A 10-year inflation swap Instead of being 217 where it should be, it's trading at 230, oh, 231 actually right now. And if you think about, that seems pretty expensive. Like, I don't know if the Fed's going to be able to get CPI above mm -hmm. 2%. Um, so I don't think CPI inflation is necessarily a great buy, but I think the rates market is giving you inflation expectations and the right. people are really cheap. So I think. That's where I differ. But I'm like out there when if you ask like most rate people and you say, where are inflation expectations? They're going to give you that CPI inflation and say that's inflation expectations. And I'm just I'm out there with the way I think. And I don't think that is the only way to measure inflation expectations because it's all it's all CPI inflation. So that's I guess just to tweak that comment, I think. Tips are pretty, you know they've had a pretty nice run and we still like tips, but it's all, you know, it's more like I dislike nominal treasuries more than I like, you know, just like tips, but everything in right. fixed income is pretty expensive, including, you know, tips have negative real yields right now. So it's not, you know, nominal treasuries are full of their own, their own risks, but I think it's just a, the options is what I think is super, super attractive. Um, just to, just to clarify. Inflation expectations as measured by the rates market, not how, how, inflation. Yeah, so, so we've you. got we've we've covered the the sort of the the type of inflation that you're working on. Mm -hmm. How how does this product co product complement other inflation uh, protection um, assets in, in in the portfolio, such as maybe gold or commodities? Can you can you offer any insights on? So so you're going to have you know the eyeball product doing this and, and, and gold might do a little bit of something a little different or the, the commodities complex itself. Any, any um, wisdom that you can share there? So I did a, a piece on gold actually um, in our, our third quarter update for IVAL. So if anybody wants it, just, just send me an email, nancy.davis at quadratic LLC and I'll send it to you because I think gold is a lot of things. It's definitely, you know, a currency play. Uh, it's definitely a psychology trade but I personally do not think it is a great inflation hedge because it's negative carry. Gold, um, and, I, and I quoted Warren Buffett because he said, you know, in the late 90s that if if people in on, you know, say there were Martians looking at the earth, they would think we were out of our mind to dig it out of 
one hole in the ground, melt it down, stick it in another hole in the ground and pay people to guard it. You know, it's like crazy, crazy what gold is. And gold has no monthly income, right? So there's no yield to gold. It has actually carry costs. And especially if you trade gold versus, you know, a lot of people use gold versus dollar. If we had inflation and interest rates moved higher, you know, gold gold is not going to be paying you anything. So I personally do not think gold, I shouldn't say, I think gold is more of a fear um, psychology thing or more of a currency bet, but it's not necessarily an inflation hedge. And I think with anything, you know, you always want to, you don't want to have all your chips on one basket, just like my, my you know, reason that I don't like just CPI is the only way to measure inflation. You know, have, have your gold. Like we have a lot of people who are gold bugs and they have eyeball too, just because you don't want to have all your chips on one thing. But um, a lot of people for inflation, they use, you know, they use equities, um, which which could work, but they're pretty expensive right now, especially some of the reflation equities or say you look at the um, commodity com companies um, or commodity sectors. A lot of those have gone up quite a bit. So I think, again, going back to I love to quote Buffett because I think he's just an oracle, but it's all where you buy stuff. And um it's uh, eyeballs up quite a bit. You know, it's it's rallied about about 20 percent since we listed the fund in May 2019. But a lot of that has been from the tips. And then we had less of a drawdown than tips by themselves in March when tips were down. Eyeball was up. And I think there are very few things that, you know, 2020 felt like almost a stage for us. Like I felt like it was like performance because. When you're long an option, you have more than one way to win. And I think that's really what investors need right now. If you just think about it, if you buy stock or you buy a bond, you have one way to make money, right? You need stock prices higher. You need interest rates lower. You need credit spreads tighter. With an option, you get the or. And so there's a myriad of different ways that we can do well with the strategy, whether it's the tips performing, whether it's the bulk performing, whether it's the delta of the options. And I think that's what investors really need because we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. You know, going back to like, what's your macro view? Like, I'm like, I cut you off right there. I was like, I have no macro view. I'm not, I'm not, I have no crystal ball. I don't believe in predicting the future. I just believe in diversification. And it's a good time to diversify because I've all, you know, it is a giraffe. It doesn't look like everything else. And I can think of a more, you know, a better environment to have inflation and inflation expectations and what's going on in today's environment right now. You know, obviously we didn't know all these things were going to happen in the future, but it just seems like the market is like in your face, just like giving it to you, you know? <laughs> Well, so, you know what? Well, let's break that down a little bit. I think it's important to understand that how you can win in different ways, right? So, yeah. eyeball. If you think about uh, <clears throat> the tips, I think it was Alex Shahidi who kind of broke it down in his book. Basically, you would expect tips to be kind of fifty percent long tr uh, traditional plain vanilla treasuries and fifty percent inflation protection, right? And so, what that means is that tips do okay it, during a period of deflationary shock, like we saw in March, right? They they actually act in a positive way during a, a massive deflation because of that, that 50% component. Then you have your long volatility options. Clearly, generally speaking, when there is a deflash, deflationary shock, interest rate, rate volatility goes up. You benefited from that, I imagine. All right, so it has this, this ability to actually profit from a collapse that is deflationary in that moment in time and then also benefit from a long-term kind of inflationary pull by the pure fact that you are benefiting from a change in the yield curve and, mm -hmm. um, and you have tips acting in a positive manner if the, if the basket, CPI basket changes. So it's a, it is that giraffe. It is a giraffe that has an ability to benefit <laughs> in those scenarios in which you don't have pure equities do or pure bonds do. Yeah, uh, that's I mean, I I thought, and it, it's, it has been very unique. I think you said it really, really well. And um, I like to say the options, the options are agnostic to the level of interest rates. Like a lot of people here, they see the word inflation. They're like, oh, this is a higher yield fund. Like it's not 
you know, we're long government bonds. We have a lot of government bonds. We like you know, low yields for a long time, negative yields. That's all good for us, too, um, because the options, they make money with either higher long dated yield. So interest rates moving higher, bond prices moving lower or front end interest rates going lower or negative. And so that's how it can work in a, as a risk off trade. The fund is long government bond duration. It is long volatility, and it can do well if the rates market starts to price in cuts or negative rates from the Fed. It doesn't. We don't necessarily need the Fed to go negative. We just need the rates market to think they're going negative. Because go from my down. experience, usually the rates market moves before the Fed itself. Um, you know, like just think about. Uh, you know, if you look at December. 2018. Um, that was when, uh, you know, there were tweets going out about, hey, Jay, you know, uh, you know, to pal and the whole rates market thought in 2019, the Fed was going to hike three times. And lo and behold, they cut three times. And so often um, what's what's expected in the market is not what actually happens in reality. And so I think the thing that I I love so much about these type of options is we don't care whether interest rates are 10% or negative 10%. We just care about the wideness, the widening between short and long dated rates. And we don't, there are a lot of different regimes when that can happen, right? Um, we could have a risk on environment like November 9th and interest rates could move higher across everything, right? Or we could have a stagflationary environment, which would mean, you know, more more risk premium priced into the curve, or we could have a depression or a recession. And, you know, we don't have say there's not enough fiscal spending, and the Fed actually does, you know, the rates market thinks the Fed's going to go negative. And that's, that's why I think the or is really important with a long option, you have, you know, kind of a, a myriad of different ways uh, to potentially win. And there are lots of different environments where other parts of the portfolio could potentially kick in, um, unlike a traditional stock and bond portfolio where you have one way to win. Yeah. You mentioned a great point, too, that there's a paper, the, the forecasting of financial markets, where they studied the ability for the Fed, who actually makes the decision on interest rates, to mm -hmm. forecast where interest rates would be in six months. And what the paper, show, what the paper showed is, and this was during the Greenspan era, is that they couldn't. Yeah. That they that, that it's a complex adaptive market with feedback loops where the, the those responsible for actually making the decision who have all the information uh, on their on their flight deck still mm -hmm. cannot with any degree of accuracy forecast that. So the product allows for a, a wonderful opportunity to think about that and say, well, I don't know, and so there's lots of possibilities, and I need to profit in those different dimensions. I, I wonder if we can, and I'm going to ask the permission of everyone here. If we can shift gears a little bit um, and just get away from the product, or does anyone have any product discussion? Because I do want to talk about the democratization of the access to these products that you have that you have accomplished to the tune of over a billion dollars. And how might we help advisors position that within their portfolio? So we've talked about the sort of the macro side. Okay, it's a mm -hmm. diversifier. How do we how do we help them? How do we, how have you got this fund, Nancy, to a billion dollars in helping this sort of it's a complicated product? It's it's a new product. So how have you helped explain it in simple terms so that we can get the adoption um, cycle up? And and then from that perspective, you know, are there any how does it fit in a 60 40? How do you think about that? Do you think about it as a component of the 40 only hedging the, the bond or does it come out as part of the inflation protection in the entire 60 40? I know that's a long question, but no, no, it's, it's a great question, though, because it goes back to the whole giraffe problem. Like it is something different. Where do people use it? And I think it's more about peeling back the onion to say, you know, what are what are what are investors doing right now in their fixed income portfolio? Like, for instance, um, many investors own short duration. And we wrote about this in our year end notes. So I'm happy to send it any, to anyone. If you just email us, you, we'll send it to you. But 
I, I think you, you should send those to Pierre too, so that that the, both of those yeah. pieces, so that we can reference them in the note and, uh, and folks can. It's them all there. on our website too. Like everything yeah. is public, okay. but I, I can send it to you. Um, Terrific. The short duration, like let's just take investors who own short duration. You know, it depends why they own it, but if they own short duration because they're worried about higher interest rates, short duration is kind of a misnomer because it's not really short anything, right? It's it's actually less long. <laughs> that should be what it's called because you're still, you know, 100% guaranteed to lose money if yields go higher. Even if you have a very short duration instrument, it's still long duration, and so many investors use it as a, you know, they might be in short duration muni or short duration high yield or short duration investment grade or short duration treasury. If your goal is you're in short duration to make money in a higher yield environment, eyeball might be a better substitute because at least we have the potential to make money uh, when your view plays out. So many people use it as a short duration trade other people use it as a tips replacement. Um, obviously, who wants to have all their chips on uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics measuring CPI? So it's a very easy tip substitute. We have other people using it just as a completion portfolio where they're saying, look, we don't have any idea what's going to happen. We just want to have diversified fixed income. Most of those clients have something that looks like a 60-40 portfolio and a lot of their fixed income managers are benchmarked to the ag and the ag has no inflation protection and the ag, a third of it approximately is mortgages, which are short balls. So they just use it to say here, we're gonna have more diversified fixed income exposure. We'll take our ag, but then we'll bolt on eyeball on top of it to give more diversity to our fixed income exposure. And then we have other people that use it as a credit substitute. And the folks who hate credit the most love eyeball the most so it's kind of like this inverse relationship like we have some people who literally hate fixed income they and they love eyeball they'll they'll call me up and they're like i hate everything in fixed income nothing looks good i think defaults are going to go higher i think corporate america is running on you know fumes um i don't like bonds and so we're like okay let's break that down what type of bonds don't you like and it tends to be things with whether it's munis high yield, distressed, investment grade, anything that has a corporate credit spread risk, many people replace that with eyeball. So we have some some clients who have 25% of their fixed income portfolio as eyeball, um, you know, like 100% would be uh, equities. And so they typically have 60% equities, 40% fixed income. And then in that 40% bucket, the more they hate credit, the more they tend to love eyeball. So I think it just depends on what people are trying to do. But I think it's been, you know, to your point, pretty, pretty popular just because everything in the fixed income market looks pretty bad right now. <laughs> so if you do think of if, if you think of your your ag portfolio is a third, a third, a third, and you've got 40 percent in fixed income, it's pretty easy math to say, well, if I put a quarter of this in eyeball, I in effect, have a quarter of my portfolio exposed to credit, a quarter to nominal treasuries, a quarter to mortgages, and a quarter to tips slash inflation protection through the um, the options, which are are sort of these uh, um, asymmetric trades. So it's kind of a notionally from the easy math in your head, it's yeah. kind of an interesting way to approach it for sure. Very yeah, cool. it's definitely a challenging time. Fascinating. For all right. Well, look, um, you know, anything, one of these. I just, sh I just want to say we're we're in, we're coming into a world where advisors are having more opportunities to diversify their portfolios and products like these. Right? It's not just Nancy's, but in Canada, Nancy, you may not know this, but we recently passed legislation that allowed for uh, much broader access to liquid alternatives for advisors. And I think in the U.S. it was a few years earlier, and so what you have is finally. You know, something that looks like different versions of giraffes. You got rhinoceroses, you know, you got giraffes, mm -hmm. you got boa constrictors. 
but it's a problem. <laughs> um, it's a real zoo out there for sure. I can't. It's, it's amazing. It is a zoo, right? Where you, up until now you've had the option of choosing between different types of ham. I told. I love that analogy. I'm going to steal it if you don't mind. I know it's terrible. But I think right? it's so good. It's good. I love it. I I want what I want advisors to take away from this is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think it's you know you have something here uh, with eyeball that is really different i mean your first losing month in 2020 was in september how many product public products out there had their first losing month in 2020 be in september right very very different but and now comes the hard part it comes you have to do your homework as an advisor you have to find these products you have to get your committee within your wirehouse and your brokerage to take a close look because oftentimes I don't know what your experience has been but oftentimes they'll have products like these be high risk and then you have to work with the committee to bring them into medium risk or low risk so that the advisors can put it into the client's portfolios so well, there is a, a bit it, is, it isn't as easy as just doing it bonds and equities I mean we've had so much success in Canada Canada is actually um, you can see it in our 13 F's our biggest investor base is actually Canadians and I feel like Wow. Um, Canadians, really? they, they don't get scared as many, many U.S. investors hear the word volatility and they freak out. But I think Canadians are more generally more mathematical and they understand, you know, also in, in Canadian inflation protected bonds have no downside floor. So a lot of Canadians use the U.S. inflation protected market because even the tips market, you know, if you hold it till maturity, there's no it can't go negative. Right. Um, whereas in Canada, it can. So I think inflation protection, Canadians accessing inflation protection in the U.S. market, plus who likes to spend money more than the United States? <laughs> so it's probably a better investment. Um, but we have a lot of Canadians that use the eyeball ETF. And you can see it's actually our, our number one holder is Canadian um, advisors. And I think Wonderful. they generally think of it as as not, you know, not just a fixed income product. You know, eyeball at the end of the day is just like a mortgage except a mortgage is less less predictable because you're short an option eyeball uses fully funded long options so it's kind of like we can underperform i'm not saying that we're always going to make money the tips have the treasuries have unlimited downside but at least with the options we always know how much we can lose so it's a safer way, in my opinion, of gaining exposure to inflation expectations because there's a downside with the options piece. So it's been actually really, really popular in Canada. Um, and I think generally Canadians think more about, you know, how do you diversify? And more people tend to be um, fiduciaries, I think, um, the way the model is, where they're actually trying to make money for their investors and they're just not taking you know, these these model portfolios that are put out from the wealth management platforms as much. Like, I feel like we have a lot of people. We actually have um, some Canadian hedge funds that use the Eyeball product within their hedge fund portfolio. So we actually have a couple of macro funds and other Canadian professional fund managers who use it because it gives access. And Mike, I think that was that was a point that you made before that I didn't I wanted to circle back to. You can't most people can't do this on their own because the rates market is over the counter. And so you need to have ISDA agreements to be able to access the rates market. And so we see Eyeball as an access product because it gives that fund wrapper, allows anyone to, you know, Eyeball is a listed security. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange. Anyone can buy uh, an ETF. Whereas the rates market, it's really hard. Even if you, we have several of our early investors were actually institutional investors um, because they can't access this product on their own. Um, even some of the Canadian pension funds, they can book swaptions or swaps or listed rate options, but they can't even book this type of product. So we really see it as being able to democratize the financial markets and give give a give a wrapper to people that allows and plus you have us managing it on it on a daily basis we're always actively managing this fund which is important if you're going to have a long ball product you want to be able to monetize and manage the exposure on a daily basis rather than you know waiting till the end of the month to rebalance or having a more I'd say a, a, a more passive ETF isn't great 
in my opinion, for options. Well, I, I can't wait to jump into those conversations. I know we're going to have you back uh, with us on our on our uh, Rifts channel and whatnot, and we will definitely be digging into exactly what you do when you have a massive asymmetric option payoff and how you stop that tail from wagging the giraffe, if you will. <laughs> so we, we yeah. just can't That's wait to get tail. in. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it'll, uh, we'll go into the next level deeper on that one. I'll, I'll save that for later. Well, Nancy, I'm blown away. You're, you're a rocket scientist. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's fascinating what you're doing. And, and I, I love that you've brought this strategy to everyone as opposed to something that was largely inaccessible for, for in, in all of history. Thank you. So, thank you for taking so much time with us. Raising our average. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You I think you raised mine. I think you could, I think the Nancy should, should finish off with the consider your average raised. <laughs> that's what the name of the show is called nancy just so you know so we Raise are uh, we're very uh very grateful to have you on and uh, you certainly have raised my average and i think uh, the canadian space will benefit from your insights oh well thank you guys so much for the opportunity i really appreciate it and um if you have any follow-up questions or you want to see um, we have all these quarterly notes that I'd be happy to send you. If you just shoot me an email, we can send you, like we did the, the Q3 one was talking about gold. The Q4 one was talking about short duration. And so happy to send those over if you'd like. Amazing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your time, Nancy. Absolutely. You. Such a pleasure. Mm -hmm.